My name is Carrie Diamond. I'm the founder of Cherry Bomb and the host of Radio Cherry Bomb. And I would like to welcome you to Chef to Chef, our chat today with the legend Jacques Pepin and Chef Angie Marr. Um, we'll be talking with them in just a minute. Um, first, this is also part of our Julia Jubilee celebration. Um, the Julia Jubilee is a virtual celebration of the life and legacy of Julia Child. And we've had so many wonderful events uh, so far, and I'm really happy that a lot of you have been able to join us for each of them. Um, today's uh, conversation and demo is brought to us by Le Creuset. Le Creuset is the amazing cookware brand. I'm sure all of you know Le Creuset really well. They have been around since 1925 and their enameled cast iron pieces are some of the most coveted pieces among the bomb squad. I know that for a fact. Um, I always had my eye on one of their uh, shiny white Dutch ovens and I was very happy when I was able to get one. Um, we're gonna be giving away one of their brand new pieces. Um, it's a Dutch oven in Artichaut. Their gorgeous new color, Artichaut, Artichoke as you know in French. And check our Instagram tomorrow for a chance uh, to be entered into the giveaway. Everyone who's tuning in today will be able, um, will be automatically entered. All right. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's joining us from all around the world. It was really great just watching everyone tell us where they're tuning in from. We've got Toronto, Aix-en-Provence in France, Omaha, Austin, all over California. So thank you everybody for tuning in uh, on your Sunday. Um, okay, we let me tell you a little bit about the folks who are going to join us. Um, Jacques, uh, I'd love to welcome you to the screen. Jacques Pepin is an absolute culinary legend and we are so fortunate to have him with us today. He has won more James Beard Awards than I could even count authored so many cookbooks. Jacques, hi. It is hi. so lovely to see you. How are you doing? I'm delighted to be with you. It's great. Oh my gosh. I mean, accolades upon accolades. And I think um, more so than anything, Jacques is so well known as a teacher and he has taught people around the world how to cook for years. Um, Jacques, it is so lovely to see you. That's what happens when you get old, you know? So many people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'm going to introduce uh, our friend, Chef Angie Marr. Angie, as many of you know, is the chef and owner of the Beatrice Inn, and she is working on a brand new restaurant, Les Trois Chevaux, that will be opening later this spring. Angie will be interviewing Jacques for us, and then Angie will be doing a demo of her oxtail bourguignon, which is a recipe that you can find in a special cookbook that the Jacques Pepin Foundation put together. Um, if you're not a member of the Jacques Pepin Foundation, I totally recommend that you join. Um, it's jp.foundation. Uh, and Jacques, you have a big fundraiser coming up, right? On May 14th that we can all buy tickets for. Yeah, we are going to cook virtually. That's the first time for me, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to do that on the 14th and on the 15th. Oh, we great. Claudine. Claudine is here, my daughter. Claudine. Hi, Claudine. Hi. Okay, Hi. Here, and, uh, we'll have and a lot of, course, of fun. Rolly, my son-in-law, who is the president of the foundation, you know, so he's the one oh, organizing. I'm just, well, I'm just the cooking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Angie will talk a little bit more about the foundation, but I just want to thank you both for joining us. And uh, Angie, I'm going to hand things over to you and I'll see you for the demo in a little while. Ooh. Bye, everyone. Hi, everyone. Cheers. Um, hi, Jacques. Hi, how are you? So well, thank you. Um, absolutely wonderful. <laughs> you too. Um, so first of all, um, you know, it is such an honor to be sitting here with you and just in conversation. And, um, you know, I, there are so many things that I think we all have learned uh, from you. And it's truly like such an amazing career. Um, so for me, it's, it's, it's really an honor to be here talking with you because, you know, when I was a little girl, I used to watch you on TV. Um, you know, I used to watch you, I used to watch Julia, and that's how I really learned how to cook before I knew I wanted to do this professionally. Um, so it's for me to be able to sit here and, and, and to chat with you and for you to be a part of my life is, is really just such an honor. So thank you for that. Um, first of all, um, so, so tell everybody, cause you know, we had a conversation the other day about, you know, when you moved to New York and you were only coming here, you weren't supposed to come here for a long time. I think you, you said you were only supposed to be here for three months. And tell us why you ended up staying and, you know, when you came here and, and what that was like. That was way before 
every one of you was born. <laughs> no, I, I moved, I, I worked in Paris at the time. My parents had a restaurant in Lyon, but I always wanted to come to America. America was, still is like the, the golden fleece, you know, or the El Dorado. So I said, I'm going to America for a year, learn the language a little bit, maybe two years and come back. And from the first time I arrived in New York, I loved it and never went back. And that was in September 1959. So that's a long, long time ago. Yeah. And uh, so now, as you can see, I totally lost my French accent. I have a Connecticut accent <laughs> now and uh, I'm purely American, that's it. <laughs> Um, so you were telling me, first of all, you were telling me a little bit about your, your first apartment in New York. And I was, I think I'm still in shock when you told me that. Um, but can you tell everybody about, you know, your first apartment in New York and where you were working and what your job was when you came here? Well, the day after I arrived, I worked at the pavilion in New York on 57 between Park and uh, Lexington. It was considered maybe the greatest French restaurant in America. And, uh, and within the 48 hours, three, four days I was here, I learned how to take the subway and went up to Columbia University to register to take classes, English for foreign students, that type of thing. Then the man who, who sponsored me to come, Ernest, he was a guy from Alsace in France, at a little restaurant called La Toque Blanche, the white hat, you know, the white tuck. It was on 50th and 1st Avenue. And uh, so on top of it, at some point there was an apartment empty. Somebody, you want the apartment there? I rented it, I said, sure. So with my friend Jean-Claude and another guy, because we had three private entrance to that apartment, the whole floor, three window on the street, three window on the back road, three big bedroom, living room, and we pay $75 a month, which was Wait, 25 bucks each. you were splitting it. Yeah, 25 bucks each. Yeah. So that's <laughs> I'm still jealous. Yeah, when you told me that the other day when we were having lunch, I was like, oh my gosh. And I thought I had a good deal. <laughs> you know, even, even at Colombia, you know, I went at Colombia and the, the, the credit, one credit was $30. That yeah. is one class, which is three hours a week, was three credit was $90. So yeah. I took two or three class. It was feasible for someone at the pavilion. I was making $85 a week. It was a lot of money for me at the time because in Paris I was doing about one hundred fifty dollars a month, you know, and uh, so wow. there eighty five dollars a week and one shift. In France it was two shifts starting nine o'clock in the morning until two. You were off from two to five and from five to ten you came back. So the whole day here it was one shift. So that was great. Yeah, um, and when did you meet Julia? Well, I met Julia. You know, six months after I was in America, uh, I knew the trinity of cooking, Craig LeBon, who started at the New York Times, James Beard, and Julia Child. So that's, and because the food world was very, very small. And right. I met her through uh, Helen McCulley. Helen McCulley is not very well known now, but at that time she was quite well known. She was the food editor of, of McCall, House Beautiful. And uh, I met her through Craig and she kind of became my, my surrogate mother. You know, she was never married, never had any kids. She was a, a beautiful lady from Nova Scotia. And, uh, and in the spring of 1960, a few months after I was here, she told me, oh, I want to show you that manuscript I just got. And I look at the manuscript of French cooking. She said, I said well, that's pretty good. I mean, I'm looking at it too. I said, I should yeah. do something like that. And she said, well, the woman uh, is in Boston, live in Boston. She's coming to New York next week. And you want to cook for her? I say, absolutely. <laughs> so we cook. She said, it's a very tall woman and she had a terrible voice. That's what <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Julia. And uh, Julia at that time uh, spoke French better than my English was at the time. So I think our conversation was in French most of the time. That yeah. was the spring of 1960, you know, that's a long, and then we became, we stay friend for, Half a century, basically. Of course, yeah. And what, so I'm curious, what did you cook for her? At that point? Yeah. Wow, on that first dinner, I don't remember what we cook. I just remember that I had a braised ham and uh, an apple tart. Yes, I wanted yeah. to do an apple galette or whatever for her. And, uh, but, you know, Julia loved to eat, loved to drink, uh, loved to have yeah. a good time. And, uh, uh, you know, we kind of agree on many things. We always say, she always said, we started cooking together. Well, 
uh, not exactly I started cooking, you know, she in France, when she was in France uh, in 1949 and so forth. That's when I enter apprenticeship, actually. So yeah. we cook in a sense the same, uh, the same kind of style and so from forth here. because uh, she yeah. was, uh, uh, you know, from France at that time and so forth. So we had a, we had a good time. And I, I cooked many times at her house in Boston. And, yeah, uh, were you, and, were you yeah. nervous cooking for her the first time? Because I was very nervous for you the first time I cooked for you. Well, I still get nervous cooking for you. Not really because it was different at the time, you know, when I met Julia, no one had ever heard of Julia. She'd never done a book. She'd never done television. She was yeah. just a lady who was doing that book. So like with other friends, come in the kitchen, start cooking together and have, have a good time. You know, we never thought about that. I mean, remember that at that time, the cook was really at the bottom of the social scale. Yeah. And any good mother would have wanted her child to marry a lawyer, a doctor, certainly not a cook, <laughs> you know. And then now, so it was totally different, you know, yeah. uh, the rapport between Cook and so forth, even yeah. with James Beard, you know, so. Well, I, I, I think my mother would still like me to marry a, a doctor or a lawyer. I don't think she's changed her <laughs> mind on that. So. <laughs> but, you know. Um, so tell me about cooking on television. And I mean, you're, you're such a natural when you get in front of the camera always. Like I'm still, you know, whenever I cook in front of people or, um, or I do TV, like I'm still to this day, like always very nervous. But I just think the chemistry that like you and Julia had on screen, was, it's just so amazing. Um, but yeah, tell but us about that. You, you, you shouldn't, and I know that you won't, if you think about what you're doing. I mean, I probably would be nervous on television if I'm not cooking, but if I'm cooking, I'm there doing something I like to do, I have to think about, I'm gonna cook that first, eat that too. So I forgot about, you know, being nervous this way. And uh, I started in television, uh, I don't know when, and the late 80, and uh, Julia started in the mid 60s, 64, I believe something like that. So uh, it was certainly, we cooked together at BU. I have, I have been teaching at Boston University for what, 37 years now. So at some point, Julia lived in Boston. And when I went to Boston, I always see her. We had lunch together or dinner, or breakfast sometimes. And I said, why don't you come at BU with us too? So she said, yes. So we start cooking together at BU, doing demonstration to in fact, we did the series for PBS, uh, I forget, in the, in the 80s or so. I remember uh, watching it. Which was the cooking in concert. We did that at BU. And it was a special for PBS, for KQED, the PBS session in San Francisco. And uh, so we did a couple of those. And that's how uh, we started really cooking on, on television together. And eventually we did that. We did series cooking show at their house there. What people don't realize is that we had no recipe. Yeah. So we decided, okay, let's do stew tomorrow. Let's do whatever. And uh, <clears throat> so that's why when we finished doing the series, it took more than two years for the series to come on the air because they wanted to do a book. And the people at the random house keep calling her and me, what did you do? What was and that? You have to look at the show over and over again. <laughs> so that was kind of a a reversal because usually when you do a show on television, you, you at least have the manuscript of the book, yeah. you know, or the back kitchen, what you're going to do and so forth, yeah. but not, not with us. Now, I feel like just over the course of your career, you have really just been such an inspiration to countless generations of, yeah. of cooks and, and of chefs and of just, just people in general. I mean, it's always so, so amazing. And I think that, you know, what you do with the Jacques Pepin Foundation, I think is so incredible because I feel like you've always wanted to teach. You've always wanted to give back. And I think that, you know, with this industry that's really what cooking is about right we, we always pay it forward we yeah. always want to nourish others yeah. but tell us about the Jacques Pepin Foundation and why I mean it, it's a cause that for me is like you know I think it's so so important but I you know tell people about why it's so important to you and, and the difference that it's made in a lot of people's lives well thank you thank you for being part of it you know in the new series with the video and so forth uh, the credit goes really to 
including my daughter and my son-in-law, Rolly, particularly. He's a chef as I am, except he has a PhD because he teaches at Johnson and Well and not been going back to school. So he created the, the foundation, you know, a few years ago, four or five years ago. And usually, I mean, the idea there is to use, I have done, like at KQED, I did 13 series of 26 shows, plus other shows. So I have hundreds of video of show, and especially of technique, I did that book called La Technique, the how to. Yes. So we use those video to teach people. And what he wanted to do and what we are doing is to work with community kitchen all over the country to teach people who have been a bit disenfranchised by life. Uh, many people uh, have been uh, incarcerated. Uh, other people are homeless people, uh, former drug addict, uh, veteran, you know, people. So it's not really young people. It's people 20, 35, 45, 55 years old to teach them the basic principle of cooking so that they can reintegrate the, you know, the workforce and start opening a little uh, eatery, a little bit, a little restaurant, you know, start working and kind of redo your life and uh, be yeah. proud of yourself and that type of thing. So it's been doing very well, but as I said, the credit goes really to uh, my son-in-law and, and Claudia, you know. Yeah, I just, you know, I think it is such an amazing um, foundation and, and what you've done to give back. And I, I think that's, you know, a lot of people um, don't realize how I think giving the culinary community is and how it's so important that, you know, we continually learn and we continually give back to the community, not just through our dining rooms, but also through charity work and, you know, and, and really, you know, what, what I think our industry does is, you know, it's ageless and it, you know, for us, it, it, it's really about, I, I, you know, I got into this very late in life. You know, I didn't really start cooking professionally till I was not even very late in life now. Are you kidding? Well, it's the moisturizer. It's the moisturizer. That's it. <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, I, I feel like I started cooking a little bit later in life. You know, I, I wasn't somebody who like, I think you, you know, I mean, your mom had the restaurant. So, you know, when were you working in the restaurant? Yeah, when I was six years old, I was cleaning, yeah. the, you know, cleaning the bottle yeah. to put the wine in it. Yeah, so finally I was, I had enough of that. I left home when I was 13 to go into apprenticeship. So, yeah, so you exactly. know, that's what, 73 years ago, I've been in the kitchen professionally, so it's a long time. But yeah. there is no question you always learn. I can't work yeah. with you. I can't work with anyone. If you look at the way other people do things, you always learn, especially in America where people come from so many parts of the world. So mm -hmm. there is always an, another angle. I mean, you can probably do a book on chicken with 10,000 recipes from uh, South Vietnam to West Africa yeah. to Turkey or Italy or whatever. So yes, you can always learn when you're in the kitchen if you open your eyes. And that's the beauty of what we do. Exactly. In addition to that, you know, we have to feed because we are hungry like two or three times a day. So it's a handless, handless uh, <laughs> situation, you know? So exactly. people say, what do you cook? What do you still like to do it? Because I'm hungry. So I have to cook, right? So yes, yeah. it is. And, and the cook are very, very generous. I mean, cook, I don't know of any great cook who are not a very generous person. You know, exactly. giving away time, giving meal, feeding people, you know, often for a very minimal amount of money, they work, but you know, you have that thing with the cook, which are generous. You know, so yeah. You and are. So talk to us about, so every time that I eat your food, which, you know, I, I just love and I watch your videos, you are using ingredients from everywhere, you know, even though, um, you know, like Pavillon and, you know, you've always cooked like very traditional French cuisine, so many of the recipes that you do, which is why I love it, it, it it's not, you know, just traditional French food. Like, mm -hmm. you know, even when you cooked for me the other day, it was like, you know, there was clams with sambal. And what inspires that? Is it the travels? Is it, you know, because yeah, you all of it, it, all of it, you know, it's true that very often, you know, I've done 30, one book, but I am regarded as maybe the quintessential French chef. Well, in fact, you open my book and on page 27, there is a 27 or whatever, uh, you have a black bean soup, uh, you know, with banana, banana sliced in it and cilantro on top. And the next page, you have a Kentucky uh, a fried chicken or, or a, a New England uh, clam chowder or lobster roll. Uh, you know, so all of those years. So I'm probably the quintessential American chef 
now, you know, after all of those years here, but certainly my wife born in New York from a Puerto Rican mother and a Cuban father. So there is that influence as well. And, uh, and you know, for all those years that I've been here working with different people, and Gloria loved, you know, Chinese food, Japanese, you know, Vietnamese and other type of food, Korean. So we eat, I mean, it's great that the point, you know, those dish that you learn as child, are very visceral, are very essential to you. And those are the greatest dish in the world. That you come to another country, someone come from Vietnam, give me that, this is the greatest dish of their youth, to, I'll taste it and say, mm, uh, you know, so you don't know. You already have to look with the eye of the people. You know, and that's what great with cooking, because yeah. there is that, especially in America, I mean, 24,000 restaurants in New York, the amount of ethnicity is unmatched anywhere in the world. You know, so that's, yeah. that's extraordinary. So what do you think, and, and you know, you and I always have conversations about, um, you know, restaurants now versus restaurants back then. And, you know, what, what kind of advice do you give, maybe especially now as, you know, kind of the, the culinary world is changing, you know, once again, it's constantly changing, but just given, you know, we've been in a pandemic and, you know, the future of restaurants is very different, but, and, you know, I, I get a lot of emails from, from students that are you know getting out of culinary school and they're worried about their future you know what the dining industry is going to be like and I you know I, I think it is it's never going to die I think that this you know this industry will always spring back but what advice do you have for younger cooks younger chefs that are you know just getting into what you know this industry now but I tell you last Monday I went back to New York the first time in a year and a half. I went to New York to go to the Pavillon there, which is the restaurant that Daniel Boulou is opening. And uh, it will not be the Pavillon, the Pavillon that I work in. The recipe will be different too. Take you even a much more casual lunch too. So things are changing. I foresee the future of the restaurant with the type of thing that you, 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 you are doing. That is, uh, you know, you're doing a cooking which is very personal very accented by you, by who you are and so forth. So I feel that it will go back, strangely enough, a little bit like my mother's restaurant. In yeah. my family in France, we had 12 restaurants that I counted owned by 12 women, not by 12 women, but by all women, my aunt, my mother, cousin, and so forth. And those were restaurants where they went to the market in the morning, they cook whatever that day. Uh, the menu was limited to five, six dish, it was fresh that day, it was very personal. The people who came to your restaurant end up being friends, coming into the kitchen you know, to see what are you cooking here. There. So I see not all, but many, many restaurants going to this. Maybe a, a smaller clientele, a more limited menu, something fresh, something very personal and all that. And uh, uh, well, your restaurant, the Trois Chevaux, are not going to be that small, but I know <laughs> you're going to do something very personal because that's who you are and you have that passion and that, uh, you know, that passion is great for cooking and, and your specific idea and all that. This is a great thing because too much we've done in the last two years where not already the photo of the chef, but sometimes you work at a restaurant and the, and the owner will tell, tell the chef, you know, next door they are doing this, a bit of Tex-Mex, they're doing a bit of yeah. this, they're doing a bit of this. Then the chef end up, okay, I'm doing a little bit of all of that. You want to be different and everyone is the same. Like all the kids with the same jean with a hole in your knee. <laughs> you know, they want to be different, but they're all the same. So uh, uh, this is uh, hopefully, you know, going to, to change a little bit because I remember that when years ago, when Andre Saltner, that you know, had yeah. Blue Test in New York, Blue Test was often considered maybe the greatest restaurant. Not even in the opinion. The point is that you could have taken me there and put something on my eye. I would have said, oh, this is Saltner cooking. I'm cooking there at Saltner. Not that it may be the greatest, but the point that it was very personal, that the way he cooked. And that's what you do too. And that's what people should do. So that's, uh, that's the great thing. Yeah. I see it more coming this way. Yeah. I hope I hope that's what it is. And I think that, you know, I agree with you. And, and, and that's honestly one of the greatest compliments of my career when you, when you said that to me that night. I remember that night because we were at my restaurant. We were at the Beatrice. I remember you saying that to me. It was one of the greatest compliments of my career. Um, we came to your restaurant with Claudine. 
you gave us like you gave us a, a, a can of caviar with a bottle of champagne to start with. <laughs> I was pretty I know you like it. I know you That's like caviar, really cool. as do I. It was awesome. <laughs> it <Yeah>. was awesome. <laughs> and all the pate, all the pate compagnia. Yeah, I love your country pate, you know, so. Uh, well, I will make more for you very soon. Yeah. I will make more for you very soon. Good. Is there anything else that you wanted to tell the audience today? No, I want to tell the audience that, uh, you know, cooking is very important that, and I think the pandemic to a certain extent brought back cooking to a certain extent in family into. I know that from the beginning of the pandemic, Claudine, who does, my daughter, who does uh, Facebook, I don't really do Facebook, had asked me, why don't you do small recipe of five, six minutes, four minutes, uh, with things that you have in your freezer or in your, in your refrigerator, in the pantry to, to show people simple stuff and we've done so far 170 of those you know which she showed all the time and it was amazing the response that we've had from people doing those simple recipe it does bring people together you know in a family you know i hate when it goes somewhere and i see the kid are on their iphone and the parent on the ipad they're eating in the corner by themselves that's horrible you know cooking Cooking is an equalizer in the kitchen, as you know, everyone is the same. But in the dining room, even more important, you have to sit around the table, you have to talk about the order of the day, you have to enjoy the food together. That's what civilization is all about. And I think yeah. that uh, the pandemic will bring a little bit of that in families. You know, so. I hope so. I really, I really hope it does. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time. Do you want to tell everybody how to um, get tickets for the event in May on the on the fifteenth, the fourteenth, and the fifteenth? On so the fifteenth, we can all know how to do it. Yeah. Okay. Here, here, here is uh, my, my son-in-law. Ronnie will tell you exactly. Hi, Willie. Hi. It's like the whole family's here. How are you? Good to see you. So nice Thank to see you in your you. kitchen. Thank you. I know I can't wait to have you guys. It's a bit of a mess right now. I'm still under construction, but you know, I can't wait to have so you guys. Have to do? So in order to sign up to join in our fun on Friday, May 14th, you guys can go to our website, which is jp.foundation, just www.jp.foundation, and then you'll get a pop-up right there and you can sign up. Uh, uh, the members, people who have joined the Jacques Pepin Foundation as a member, we launched membership back in November, get a half price ticket. So if you wanted to sign up for a membership, that could, uh, that could make it easier for you for the tickets. And with membership, you get access to great videos like the one that you mm -hmm. made for us, Angie, that you're going to make today, your oxtail bourguignon, which is in our video recipe book and a hundred other recipes from other chefs. So uh, we hope you guys will come and visit us. And we're really not happy to be with you today. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for taking the time. Thank you. Happy you cooking. So Bye. Bye. Love you. Love you soon, you Angie. Bye -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, Elaine. Jacques, thank you so much. Angie, that was wonderful. Oh my gosh. I we could have had Jacques on forever, unfortunately. I talk to him forever. I'm like, I you know. don't need to see me cook. We should just keep talking to Jacques. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we we grabbed him for as long as we could today. So um, anyway, we'll have to have him on Radio Cherry Bomb and hopefully uh, we'll get yeah. to have more conversations with him. What an amazing teacher he's been over the decades. Like I mentioned at the start, I think 24 James Beard Awards, wow. Emmy Awards, uh, Légion d'Honneur, if I'm saying that right, from, from France. Just amazing. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to get some advice from him about... Uh, how to make beef bourguignon, but you're gonna you're gonna show us right now how to make the oxtail you bourguignon. Know, I, I was so like I was so obsessed with just hearing his story. So here's the thing, like you know, I I've been very lucky to um, have a friendship with him uh, over the co last couple of years, and every time I'm around him, I'm just like always so enthralled to like <laughs> listen to his stories because he just is just such a wealth of knowledge. And I think that anybody that has the chance to you know go revisit one of his many many books, you absolutely should because yeah. Even now, you know, as even as a professional chef, um, you know, I, I sit here and I look back through his cookbooks and through his memoirs, and it's just truly, really, really incredible. So I yeah. think that his memoir is beautiful. How did you two become friends? I kidnapped him for dinner. <laughs> I did. I actually kidnapped him for dinner one night. Uh, we were on a panel one night, and I, I, 
I, I was like, he's coming back to the Beatrice for dinner from Hell or High Water. So I kidnapped him. And then that we've been so funny. ever since. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I totally encourage everyone to, to read his books and join his foundation if you can, because it's, it's rare that we get to continue to learn from a legend like Jacques, but also support everything that he does. Um, you know, I'm a bit of a history buff. And uh, Angie, like you were saying, you could go in so many directions with Jacques. You could talk to him about how to cook. You could talk to him about, I loved hearing about his family restaurants. I mean, that that makes me want to do a cherry bomb story on his 12 family restaurants all run by the women in well, his family. But yeah. he also, he cooked for Charles de Gaulle and he turned down the Kennedys. The Kennedys wanted him to be a White House chef. And he said, no. <laughs> yeah. I know his stories are just so incredible. So I'm yeah. just gonna, I'm just gonna start cooking while we're while Great. we're chatting. Is that okay? Absolutely. So tell everyone what you're making, Angie. Okay. So the okay. So <laughs> while I was watching, while I was about eight years old, and I was I was like standing on a step stool in my dad's kitchen. Um, we used to have this like little black, you know, it was like I'm very old. So like I used to have those like you know those black and white TVs with like the turn knobs for the dials. Yep. Um, that's the TV that we had in our kitchen. And so I used to be in the kitchen with my dad on Sundays and, uh, and he would make bread every Sunday morning and then we would do like a roast or a braise. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Bouc Bourguignon is one of the very first recipes that I ever learned how to make. Um, and it was just, it was just like one of those things that uh that came out of julia's book and mm -hmm. and uh you know I, I still have my my first uh book my first julia child book and this wow. came with the book for it's like splattered with red wine and beef fat and it you know it sits on my shelf at home and i i just love it so all right so i'm gonna get started can you guys see the pot can you guys see all this back here we can see it on the second yes everybody should check out the second video and i should give a shout out to le Creuset. Um, they sent Angie some beautiful, uh, yes. some beautiful Dutch ovens and other um, pans and pots to cook with, and that is the the new color Arta Show, which is so what a beautiful green that is. It's perfect for spring. So, um, so I'm just going to start by searing the oxtail. No, you seasoned you seasoned those with a lot of salt. Should people not be afraid to use that much salt? Yeah, everybody thinks I'm crazy to use this much salt, but I'm actually not because it needs it. Um, so you can really do book for the yawn with uh, with anything and you know any cut. Um, you know, traditionally you would do it with like the shoulder or just like something that you could braise. I personally really, really love oxtail because I just think it's unctuous and it's velvety. Um, and it's really, really delicious. So for me, the on done with oxtail is like perfect. Um, so I'm just gonna take some time to brown this. <laughs> Someone asked why your hair is not tied back. And she's cooking for herself. <laughs> for herself. <laughs> so she can wear her hair down. It's, it's Sunday and she's off today. She's building a new restaurant. So Angie can let her hair down with the bomb squad today. Angie, what do you ask your butcher for when you, when you buy oxtail? What do I ask my butcher for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I usually ask my butcher for oxtail, the meaty pieces of the oxtail, because when you think about it, you have like the whole tail. So it's mm -hmm. thicker up here and it gets thinner down here. Okay. I like both of them, but I like to ask for meaty pieces that are cut about three inches. Um, you can obviously have them trim some of the fat. Um, okay. I tend to just leave it because I like that, that unctuousness. Okay. And Barbara mentioned, Angie, this isn't for you, but Barbara, I think you have to adjust your view because right now you should all be seeing two uh, shots of Angie. Um, you see the wider kitchen shot and then you see a shot that's a lot uh, tighter on her pots. If you don't see that, go up to the view and click on that. Allison, you only see one as well. Go up to where your view is and click on, click on gallery. Okay. That should help everybody. Try that. View is in the top right-hand corner, okay? All right, can't change a view on an iPad. Okay, well, we'll keep talking so you can kind of get a sense of what Angie is doing. The, um, camera on? No, 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 you're good, you're good. I think some people okay. can't see, um, they're only, they have to adjust their view. Um, there we go. So Donna's gonna move around what everybody sees. So now you see Angie putting in, what are you putting in now, Angie? 
I just, I just feel the frowning off tail right now. Great. And I just have to tell you guys that I'm like so obsessed with all this Le Creuset stuff. So thank you so much Le Creuset. For yes, thank it. you to the Le Creuset team for sending this over to Angie. Now, Angie, as this, how long do you have to do this part? So I just, I basically brown the oxtail for maybe like eight to 10 minutes, just until it's nice and golden. Um, I am gonna add my carrots and my pearl onions in as well. Okay. So you could use how? chipolini juice. Um, but right now I, just, I have some white peeled pearl onions, which I really love. How do you prepare the pearl onions? So you can get them peeled if you want. Okay. Um, you could also, uh, if, if you get them with their, their paper salon, you just dip mm -hmm. them in some hot water um, and the skin will just slip right off. Okay. Did you, Angie, I don't know if you caught our chat last week with uh, Stanley Tucci and Ina Garten, but they were talking about Julia okay. Child's beef bourguignon recipe. And Ina ah. was saying how she simplified it over the years because back in Julia's day, the cuts of beef were much tougher and you really did have to cook it for like four hours. Yeah, I only actually cooked my, uh, cooked my beef bourguignon for maybe about two and a half, three hours. Mm -hmm. um, it really just kind of depends on the cut of meat. I think for oxtail, it usually ends up being around three. Okay. All right, everyone's happy now. They can see all three views. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, everyone, for okay. bearing with us. And then, Angie, how about the carrots? Do you cook the carrots beforehand, or do they go in just peeled? No, I just go in raw because they're going to be in here for a while. So, okay. um, the great thing about this working on, and this is one of the things that like, I always make this, for Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, the great thing about this organion and really any grace for that matter is for me, it's just kind of like this great one pot thing. Mm -hmm. um, I really love because, you know, like right now I'm obviously cooking in my kitchen at the restaurant, uh, but typically on a Sunday I'm, I'm cooking at my kitchen at home. And, you know, I've got like a typical New York apartment, so mm -hmm. uh, there's really not a lot of room. Um, so for me, uh, you know, anything that I can really do in like a one pot thing and just like leave it and forget about it, I'm like all about. Okay. Now, I hate splatters, but you're not putting the top back on that. I am going to put the top back on very shortly. Um, but right now, I'm going to add a little bit of flour to this, okay? And we're just going to go straight in, maybe like a tablespoon or so. Um, but what this is going to do is it, we're going to brown the flour. I'm going to give this a toss in a second. Mm -hmm. We're going to brown the flour and then add the wine and the stock. And what that's going to do is it's just going to kind of help thicken up the gravy just a bit. Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to the wine and the stock, what kind of stock are you using? So for this, I'm going to use um, just like a nice light beef stock. Okay. Uh, and a red wine. And, you know, everybody's always like, what wine should I use? Yeah. You know, I typically go with something that I would like to drink. Um, for this one, I'm going to use just like a, a Cabernet. And then how about if you, uh, someone asked if you're gluten-free, can you use cornstarch instead of flour in this? I've never tried that, but what I would actually do for gluten-free, what I typically do is I would just omit the, um, the flour, and I would just take the time at the end to reduce the sauce a little bit more. And it's actually really good that you brought that up with gluten-free, because the thing is, is that with oxtail, here, I'll show you. Mm -hmm. With oxtail, you obviously, like, have this, oh, can you guys all see that, right? Mm -hmm. See that? So you have this bone right here in the middle, and the great thing about this cut is that it's got so much collagen in it that you actually, if you wanted to omit the flour, you absolutely could. Um, and you would still get thickness on the gravy if you reduced it because okay. all of this, all the bones here, mm -hmm. when you braise it, it's gonna ex extract all of this amazing collagen out of it. You're not gonna get that thick of a stew if you were to go with, uh, let's say a beef shoulder, which mm -hmm. doesn't have the bone, 
it is marble, there's fat in it, but it's really about the bone and the collagen, which is why I love this. You would also do well um, if you are going to go gluten free to maybe use like a short rib, a, a bone in short rib. Right. Um, you would still get a really nice sauce on that as well. Okay. Some folks are saying that they've made Julia's and followed it step by step, and it was absolutely worth the time that it took to make it. Oh, 100%. That is the classic. So everyone should make that at least once. Everyone should make that at least once. So not a dozen times. And some stock in here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave this. Okay. And I'm just gonna put the lid on. Is and anyone else impressed that Angie is wearing white in the kitchen and cooking with red wine? I I'm <laughs> I am. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what, I, I actually, it's so funny because I always go to Carbone and I, for some reason, I wear white there all the time, but I, and I eat all the pasta and for some reason I can end up like with no pasta sauce, which is shocking. <laughs> you can either cook this on the stove top or you could pop it in the oven. If you are maybe cooking at home and your kitchen is like a little bit smaller, what I like to do is I would just put this in the oven at like, you know, 300 degrees and just let it simmer. I would make sure you've got a really tight fitting lid. Okay. Um, so I actually have another bouffe bourguignon that I did a little bit earlier this Ooh. morning. Oh my God. <laughs> that <laughs> looks so good. I learned that TV magic from Jack. So we'll see oh. him for that. Um, let me ask, that's, that's rapidly boiling. Like how, is that okay? It's gonna be fine. It's like, usually you want it to just simmer. Right okay. now, I'm at the point where like I brought the heat up a little bit because I want the sauce to reduce. Okay. Um, but you can just tell. I mean, the meat is just like wow. off, off the bone, tender, and everything is just kind of like gorgeous. So. Oh my God! Someone said, "Where's the smell of vision?" Exactly. I wish I could <laughs> smell that right now. Angie did ask if I wanted to come to the kitchen and and interview her in the kitchen. I should have I said yes. Ask Carrie. She wanted to come for lunch. I did. I no, regret it. I regret it. I'm going to be eating this by myself. Oh my gosh. That is a great Oscar meal. If anyone is watching the Oscars tonight. So you um, guys can see it's still a little uh, loose, but I'm just going to leave it uncovered. And I'm just going to simmer it uncovered for um, maybe like 10 to 20 minutes more. And it should get like really beautiful and shiny. I do like to finish it off with a little bit of butter. Um, okay get some sheen on the sauce and then some fresh cut parsley uh, mm -hmm. just, just to bring it a little bit brighter. Okay. Now, the do you take the meat out as you reduce the stock? You can if you want. Um, I typically don't. I just leave it. I'm very, like, when I'm cooking at home, I'm just, like, home cooking and I just use one thing. But okay. if I'm not going to take it out of here while I'm reducing it, I would mm -hmm. put it in a bowl and I would ladle some of the sauce into it, cover okay. it with foil just to like tend to keep the moisture in. Mm -hmm. um, when you remove the meat completely and it's not with any liquid or uncovered, it's going to dry out. That's with any grains. So just make sure that if you are going to take the meat out while you're reducing this, that you uh, that you put a little bit of the, the, the gravy in there and cover it. Now tell us how you would serve that once it's done. So there's a couple different things with this. I would, um, and it really, I think it depends what kind of mood you're in. Mm -hmm. So initially you could serve this with either buttered potatoes, um, mm -hmm. which I, when I do that, I just do red uh, Yukon, or either red or Yukon potatoes. I boil them with a little bit of salt and herbs, mm -hmm. drain them and I just toss them in butter. I use like really, really delicious, very, very fatty, very rich uh, French butter, the bird brat and then a little bit of uh, parsley. Okay. And um, then you could also do it with egg noodles as well. I think Julia used awesome. to do it with egg noodles. That's how my mom did it with egg noodles. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you put herbs, Angie, you said when you boil the potatoes, you put salt and herbs in the water? Yeah, I do. I've never put herbs in the water when I'm making potatoes. Really? Oh, I always do, just to give it a little bit more of an aromatic. Mm -hmm. What do you put in there? I do thyme, uh, salt, and pepper. Okay. Uh, okay. That's a great suggestion. Uh, we're getting a few questions about pearl onions. I know they're really hard to find. Have you ever used frozen? I've never used frozen. Okay. 
If anyone has advice for frozen pearl onions, uh, mention it in the chat, that would be great. Uh, okay, so you're gonna serve this, it's so amazing. And this only gets better if you have leftovers, which is kind of hard to imagine, it only gets better in time, right? Yeah, it only gets better in time. I'm gonna put it in, I'm gonna actually put it up because I feel like it's gonna be fine right now. Okay. Um, so we have our new like washable plates, Carrie and first people that I'm showing this to. Beautiful. Very excited. We'll um, talk about the restaurant in just a minute. So I'm just going to serve this up. I mean, I, for me, I like a lot of meat. So that's just me. Our friend uh, Diane said that Ina uses frozen pearl onions. Okay. Does she? Okay. They're good enough for Ina. They're good enough for all of us. Exactly. By the way, Ina is the other person that I feel really, really taught me to cook besides Jacques is that I used to watch Ina all the time when I was, uh, when I was just, you know, just cooking at home and just like kind of learning. Oh my gosh. I would love Ina and Jacques Pepin. That would be another dream, another dream collab. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Can we do that? We could try. <laughs> we can try for anything. Um, okay. I'm going to bring this around to the other okay because I feel like it's better. Angie, what's the difference between pearl onions and a more traditional onion? Well, the pearl, I mean, you know, they're smaller, they're a little bit sweeter. Um, and for me, I like the sizing of pearl onions. I think they're perfect for, especially when we're doing like individual plates like this. Um, you know, they're gonna stay together as well. So like if you were gonna do a braise where you were straining out the, uh, the onions and you just wanted the flavor. And I would say definitely do a bigger onion, do like a Spanish onion, um, do something that you can strain out. But if you want something that you're actually gonna be able to see and serve, you can actually see how, um, do you see that right there? How the onion has like, it stays together. Um, and I, you know, I like things that I can just like, I can see it, I know what it is, it's beautiful. And it's just, it's bite-sized. Someone said pearl onions are best because they're cute. That is true. <laughs> they're cute. I they agree with that. Cute onion. Angie, we also have uh, Carolyn has a, uh, a Le Creuset question. She's considering buying a nine quart oval. Do you yeah. have any thoughts on the ovals versus the rounds? Versus and the, the rounds? Quarters? Yeah. Um, you know, I love both. And mm -hmm. in my kitchen, I have both. Um, you know, I think that if you're going to, because they're, they're an investment piece. And the, the great thing about Le Creuset is that, I mean, your grandkids are going to have that, you know, your yeah. great grandchildren are going to have the Le Creuset because they're just so perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if you are going to get only one, I would absolutely get the oval um, because at the end of the day, like you could do this in the round, you could do it in the oval, but the oval is fantastic because I actually like to roast birds yeah. in the oval uh, Le Creuset. So I think they're just kind of perfect. Um, I mean, you could do whole chickens, you can do turkey, like it's, yeah, the oval is, if you're gonna invest in one one good piece, just like we would invest in like, you know, one good little black dress, I would absolutely invest in in an oval Le Creuset for sure. Okay, great. Do you have a favorite Le Creuset color? Oh my gosh. I mean, I, I'm really kind of digging the uh, the artichoke right now, uh, but, I, but I also do love the whites as well. Someone mentioned, I think that they or someone in their family got passed down the flame from a grandmother. That's and so amazing. I think that's one of the original colors and yeah. such a beautiful orange color. Um, I, what I wanted to ask Jacques and someone else, someone else mentioned this in the chat, how does he keep those pans clean? Like, what are your chef secrets? Like, I know you're just using the Le Creuset's that they sent over, but they're so shiny and new. I was so jealous. And then all of Jacques' pans look like they were brand new. Yeah, I know. They're so great. Um, well, I don't know what he does to keep all of his pans clean. Because, you know, I mean, that man is cooking a lot. Uh, <laughs> but for us, you know, we, we have one day a week where we soak them um, mm -hmm. and we just, we go to town and we just scrub. Okay. Somebody said barkeeper's friend. Do you use that? No, I don't know what that is. It's that scrub that you can use. I'm sure now oh, we're going to, and some people. Is. Now, some now people I'm going to have to like, research it. Some people, it looks like in the chat are camp Bona Me and some are camp uh, barkeeper. So we'll see. Oh, All right. Well, let's, have to uh, Angie, while we still have you, let's chat a little bit about what you have been up to because it has been quite the year for you. You closed. Um, <laughs> You closed uh, your beloved Beatrice Inn. 
um, um, that you were the chef and owner of, and you worked so hard yeah. last year during the pandemic to keep it open, um, but you decided time was up and you literally are opening a restaurant next door. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about the new restaurant? Yeah, uh, so the new restaurant is called Le Tour Chevaux, and um, you know it's actually so amazing that uh, that I was able to sit here with Jacques because I had every intention of um, of opening this restaurant as Beatrice Inn, mm -hmm. and you know it was wow. really incredible because I you know Tejal Rao from the Times who I just absolutely adore she did this amazing piece about how the Beatrice was moving next door and um it was just so incredible because uh you know the day after that piece came out in the times uh you know Jacques called me and he said you you cannot open the Beatrice you absolutely cannot and I said what do you mean like I'm opening the Beatrice like it's already done and he said no you can't he's like you are at the stage uh in your career where you need to believe that it's time for you to have something that bears your name. Wow. Something that's been handed down to you. And I need you to believe that. Wow. Cause uh, someone might not know this, but Angie was hired to be the chef at the Beatrice Inn and she wound up buying it from the original owner. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, it was a very pivotal moment for me because, you know, he said that to me and I, I sat there and, wow. uh, you know, thought about it for probably a good month, month and a half. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, you know what, he's right. And, uh, you know, I, I'm ready to do something new. Um, I think I've been ready for a long time. Um, and I think that New York is really ready mm -hmm. to grow again. I think it's ready to be reinvented. I mean, that's the great thing about New York, right? We're constantly reinventing ourselves. Um, and, you know, I really wanted to be a part of that. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be a part of that because the energy here right now is so palpable. Um, it's, it really just is tremendous, the creative energy right now in the city. So, um, you know, to, to call it Le Toi Chavot, which is naming it for my family. I mean, I, my last name in Chinese um, it means horse mm -hmm. and I have two younger brothers. And so when we were kids, my dad and my uncles used to call us the three horses, uh, yeah. was our nickname. So, you know, for me to do a restaurant that really paid homage to my family and my roots and also the cuisine that I love, um, you know, really mixed into one, um, and to have the opportunity to start from an entirely blank slate, uh, you know, is, is something that's just so tremendously exciting and, and I'm so grateful for. Can you tell, I know you haven't said much about the menu yet. Can you tell us anything? <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's still being worked out. Mm -hmm. It's still being worked out. Um, you know, I can tell you that it will uh, absolutely be a departure from what I was doing at the Beatrice. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we can get out of Angie <laughs> about the menu. So we have to wait. And this, you know, you know, I had some restaurants and this is always a, a restaurateur's least favorite question, but when do you expect to open the new restaurant? Oh, that is like the million dollar question. I know, sorry. I'm, sorry to even ask. I'm sorry to even ask. I think it's, I think it's going to be at this point, I think it's going to be, uh, you know, probably late May. Okay. Um, yeah, it'll be late May. We are, as I'm talking to you from my kitchen right now, I, uh, you know, I mean, the crown moldings are being, uh, being painted like right outside of my kitchen and, you know, the, the floors just got done. So I, I think it's going to be late May. So tremendous. And this is Angie's new kitchen behind us. And some folks, uh, Pamela, yes, late May, 2021. Some folks might not realize this if you were never at the Beatrice or you just didn't realize when you went in, Angie's kitchen was so tiny. I mean, she <laughs> made so many miracles out of that kitchen. And now you've got, your kitchen is how many times the size of your previous? Five times. Five times. Yeah, wow. it's five times the size of our old kitchen. We're so excited. I don't even, I, I think that we actually, when we got in here and we got the equipment installed, we actually all cried. We were so excited. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Somebody wants to know what kind of salt. Oh, and if folks have questions for Angie, I forgot to even look yeah. at the Q&A box. Angie, what kind of salt do you use? 
kosher. So I use uh, the diamond crystal kosher. I really love it because it has a nice grain to it. And, um, you know, I can really feel when I pick it up, like how much I'm seasoning. I'm, you know, I, I know it's so terrible because like, you know, I, I've written a cookbook and it's like, you know, I think that it was the constant struggle. Carrie, you've done it too, is the measurements, right? Measurements are always the hardest thing. And I think as, you know, as a cook, it's like, I just want to, you know, cook off of instinct, but the, mm -hmm. but using the, the diamond crystal is like really, really fabulous because of the grains, you, you actually know what you're, what you're grabbing and, and how much you're, you're using. Okay. Did you put oil in the pan first? I did. I used a little bit of olive oil, not too much. Okay. Okay, great. And then um, how about your team? I know um, folks who don't know Angie, she for years has always been one of the, one of my favorite chefs because she always recognizes her team. Um, and and gives them credit for all the amazing work that she does. Um, will you be able to bring some of your team back for the new restaurant? Um, yes, my entire team is coming back. Wow, wow. Yeah, my entire team is coming back. I am so excited. I, you know, we always sit here and, you know, Carrie, you and I have talked about this always, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, I think that chefs quite often get, uh, you know, the majority of the credit and, and, you know, like our faces or our names are put in spotlight. But the reality is, is that, um, you know, no great achievement can be done on, on your own. And, uh, you know, we are nothing, chefs are nothing without their team mm -hmm. and the strength of their team. Um, so for me, you know, we have been working so hard over the past, uh, you know, eight years that I was at the Beatrice to really build the right team, you know, and it, it takes a while. It takes a while, right? Like, I think for those of us in the industry, we know it's like, you've got your really good ones. You've got people that you think are good, but they're not. And you got to get rid of those people. And then you've got people that just, you know, aren't going to work at all. But when you find the really great ones and you hold on to them and you cultivate them, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is really what make restaurants and an experience uh, just absolutely remarkable. It's a family. And Angie, folks are asking, where is the new restaurant? Can you tell us again? So I'm right next door to the Beatrice Inn. Um, well, where the Beatrice Inn was. Uh, so I'm at 283 West 12th Street. And uh, that's on the corner of West 4th and West 12th in the West Village. Great. Well, Angie, thank you so much. Hopefully everyone's following Angie on Instagram and following her new restaurant, Les Trois Chavaux. Um, Angie also has a gorgeous cookbook. Um, if, you want to, if you don't live near New York, you're not going to be in New York anytime soon. You can also pick up Angie's gorgeous cookbook and support her that way. Um, Angie, I can't thank you enough. I know you could have talked to Jacques for like two hours and that okay. would have made... For the rest of my life. Oh my gosh. Well, hopefully you'll, <laughs> you'll be spending more time with him and maybe we'll get another opportunity to Absolutely. interview him. So thank you for your time. I know it's uh, Oscar day. It's a big, uh, it's always, it's always a big day. I want to thank everybody out there for joining us and for taking part in the Julia Jubilee, our virtual celebration of the life and legacy of Julia Child. Um, thank you so much to Le Creuset for supporting this chat and demo and for sending Angie uh, those beautiful um, pieces in Artist Show that is a gorgeous, gorgeous green color. And for everybody out there, we'll be giving away one of the um, Dutch ovens in Artist Show on Instagram tomorrow. You'll all be automatically entered, but make sure um, you check out the Le Creuset giveaway on Instagram tomorrow. I also want, I should mention our magazine. So for those of you who don't know about Cherry Bomb, um, we are a magazine that's all about women and food and our brand new issue is all about Julia Child. So be sure to check out that. And um, Angie, as always, you're the bomb. Thank you, Carrie. It was so great to be here. Thanks thank you so for coming. All right. And thank you, everyone. Uh, don't forget, we've got more amazing programming as part of the Julia Jubilee. Uh, tomorrow, we've got more talks and demos all week long. Just go to cherrybomb.com to check out the schedule. All the programming is free, thanks to our wonderful sponsors. But you do have to RSVP. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. And we'll see you tomorrow.